The Pure Blood Pretense by Murky Blue Matter, Chapter 5. The next morning, when Rigel stepped into the common room, she found Pansy sitting quietly on one of the low back chairs, glancing through their transfiguration text. The blonde girl was really quite pretty in the pale green light coming through the windows from the lake. She was also very good at pretending to be absorbed in her reading. Rigel changed her heading and waited for Pansy to acknowledge her. Pansy closed the book neatly and flicked luminous blue eyes up to meet hers. Good morning, Rigel. Good morning, Rigel nodded toward the common room door. I'm going to take a walk. I would love to come with you. Pansy rose, and Rigel noticed she was already dressed to go to breakfast despite the early hour. She gallantly offered her arm, feeling beyond silly, even as Pansy gracefully rested her hand on Rigel's elbow. They left the common room, and Rigel led them toward the entrance hall. She thought Pansy's robes and shoes looked too thin for prolonged cold, and she'd seen enough of the dungeons yesterday, so she decided they'd walk the first floor, and perhaps the basement, if they had time. Rigel especially wanted to figure out where the painting that led to the kitchens was. As they walked, Rigel learned many things about the girl. Pansy was named after a kind of violet because her mother was so fond of them and she was an only child. Her parents had arranged a series of private tutors for her over the years, so she had come to Hogwarts with a full background in wizarding law, pure-blood etiquette and magical history which included extensive knowledge of the most famous and influential people and families in the Western wizarding world. She confided to Rigel her opinion that the reason no one had ever tried to have their history professor, Binns, replaced by someone more competent was because most of the students, and especially those from influential families, were already so well versed in it. Pansy mentioned an interest in taking care of magical creatures in her third year, because when she was younger... A herd of unicorns had moved into the forest behind her mansion, which was a wizarding wildlife preserve, and she had grown close to the beautiful creatures before they moved on. By the time they entered the great hall for breakfast, Rigel knew that Pansy's favourite colour was periwinkle, and that she hated the colour lavender because she was allergic to the plant, and that her greatest ambition was to learn to bake. Her grandmother allegedly made the most delicious pies and cakes, better than any house elf, but her mother refused to let Pansy practice at home after the third fire-related incident. Rigel found she didn't mind Pansy's company as long as Pansy was content to talk about herself. She reminded Rigel of Archie a bit, the way she carried the whole conversation easily without becoming annoying. Come to think of it, Draco reminded her a bit of Archie, too, the way he impulsively pursued whatever he happened to be interested in at the time. It seemed Rigel had unconsciously drifted toward the familiar, however much it had seemed as though Pansy and Draco had been the ones to attach themselves to her. They strolled over to the Slytherin table together, and Rigel waited politely for Pansy to take a seat before doing so herself, noting as she did that Pansy had manoeuvred her into sitting next to Malfoy once again. She wondered if it was her fate to be ever between the two of them. "'Good morning,' Pansy said to the General Assembly of First Years. "'Where were you two this morning?' Davis asked. "'Walking.' Pansy buttered a scone with care. "'It's a rather refreshing way to begin the day.' "'Just walking?' Greengrass asked with a suspicious look at Rigel. "'There was talking involved as well, I believe,' Rigel said. Pansy gave a startled laugh. "'You have a way with understatement.' Her eyes twinkled mischievously, and she looked as though she had solved a great puzzle. "'I knew you must have a sense of humour if you were raised by Sirius Black and James Potter. "'I think most of the professors are waiting anxiously for the practical jokes to begin,' Zabini added, a slight smile playing about his mouth. "'The Weasley terrors have spent every meal since the sorting on the edge of their seats with anticipation.' Rigel inspected the Gryffindor table, where there did indeed seem to be two identical redheads alternately glancing around the hall and staring at her with disappointment. She shrugged her shoulders, saying, "'I have no talent for pranks.' "'Well, as your dorm mate, I'm much relieved,' Not told her. "'And if you ever decide to take up the family mantle, do us a favour and practice on the Hufflepuffs.' "'I'm not sure that Malfoy and Pansy deserve that.' she said blandly. The others gave her confused looks, but Malfoy glared, 
and Pansy tapped her knife against Rigel's water goblet reproachfully. Rigel thinks he's being funny, calling us Hufflepuffs because we badgered him so much yesterday, Pansy said, a sweet smile blooming on her face, the only foreshadowing of her revenge. You see, he had a little trouble with the charms we learned, and we were only trying to help, weren't we, Malfoy? Malfoy played along just as sweetly. We were indeed, and Black isn't the only one with a talent for understatement. His attempts were simply abysmal, weren't they, Parkinson? Oh, you must call me Pansy, the blonde girl said cheerfully. After all, we'll be working together a long time if we're to try and teach this plebeian how magic is supposed to be performed. Then I insist you call me Draco, Malfoy said gallantly, shaking his head sadly at Rigel, for I fear we have a long road ahead of us. "'See if I sit by you two in transfiguration?' Rigel muttered into her breakfast. "'Oh, you will, if only because we sit by you,' Pansy assured her. Rigel supposed she deserved it for calling them puffs in front of their yearmates, but now everyone half suspected she was a squib, if their embarrassed glances were any indication. Ten minutes later they followed a prefect to transfiguration, where a cat sat silently on the professor's empty desk. Rigel stared at the cat a suspicion forming in her mind. She had been around Animagi the whole of her childhood, and between Sirius and James she knew an animal that was not an animal when she saw one. Sure enough, as the clock on the wall chimed the hour, the cat leapt off the desk, transforming mid-air into the stern-faced woman who'd met them before their sorting. Most of the class released quiet gasps and looked at their neighbours in awe. Professor McGonagall turned to the blackboard and waved her wand at a piece of chalk. It animated and began writing while she introduced herself and called Roll. "'Welcome to Transfiguration,' she said, not sounding at all welcoming. "'This is a very difficult subject, and I expect you all to work hard and apply yourselves to it. There will be no fooling around in here. Next to potions, it is the branch of magic where things can most easily go wrong if you aren't extremely careful. Mr. Black!' Rigel contained her jump, but could not help giving the woman an alarmed stare. "'Yes, Professor?' Uh, "'You knew or guessed I was not all I seemed when you first walked in,' she commented. Rigel wondered just how she had figured that out, but said, "'Yes, Professor. How?' Uh, "'You were too still,' Rigel said after a moment. "'Cats are naturally quiet animals, but you were watchful, so I guessed you were a human in animal form.' "'Why not assume I was a familiar or some other intelligent animal?' McGonagall pressed. Rigel sensed she was the kind of professor who always wanted the most complete answer possible. It seemed unwise to tell the class that her father and uncle were animagi, so she just shrugged, saying, "'All of our professors have been in the classroom when we arrived. Someone mentioned you left the staff table before we finished breakfast, and the markings around your eyes were unusual for a tabby cat.' "'Excellent observational skills,' McGonagall nodded briskly. Five points to Slytherin. "'It is vital that you begin to develop an awareness for magic at all times. "'Magic can be used to deceive the unsuspecting, "'especially transfiguration, which is the magic of turning one thing into another, "'but there are almost always signs, if you remember to look for them.' "'She spent the rest of the lesson teaching them to turn matches into needles, "'and Pansy and Malfoy, predictably, had much better luck than Rigel. "'Mine's gone silver,' Pansy smiled proudly. "'They had been warned that the chances of anyone succeeding the first day were slim. "'I think I've got a hole in one end of mine,' Malfoy added, looking satisfied. "'The two of them turned to Rigel expectantly, and she glanced down at her match. "'Oh, look, I've made a match.' She feigned a dreamy sort of joy. They both sighed at her, so she offered a small but real smile. "'You both did very well. I'm so proud,' she added, just to see them scowl at her again. They looked like twins when they did that, both pale-skinned with blonde hair and expressions of amused exasperation. "'You're impossible,' Malfoy declared. At this rate they'll kick you out by the end of the week and then Pansy will cry and Zabini will move into the empty space in our dorm to get away from Crab and Goyle and I heard he snores. I'll miss out on my beauty sleep and Pansy won't be able to use her glamour spells on me. I do not use glamours. Because she'll be too distraught and crying and I'll grow up to be ugly and therefore uninfluential and it will be all your fault. Rigel rolled her eyes and turned back to her match, figuring she could at least practice the incantation some more. 
She felt Malfoy glaring at her, as though she'd committed some unconscionable crime by not being talented like he was. The longer he stared at her, willing her to be something that she wasn't, the more she began to wish fervently that she had something pointy to jab him with, so the superior ass would stop bothering her. Pansy inhaled a sharp breath, and Malfoy's stare shifted abruptly to her match, except it wasn't a match any more. It was a needle. "'Oh, well done, Mr Black!' Professor McGonagall had come to check their work. Ten more points to Slytherin. Mr Malfoy, Miss Parkinson, you have made very good attempts as well. As soon as she walked away, Pansy mouthed, Fifteen points to Slytherin in one class. Malfoy shot her a look that said, Focus. Black, how in Merlin's name did you do that? Same as you, I expect, Rigel said, quite shocked herself, but unwilling to show it. "'You didn't even say the incantation!' he hissed fiercely. The look of awed confusion on his face made Rigel uncomfortable, so she lied. "'Yes, I did. You must not have heard it over the sound of your own superiority!' The insult didn't even distract him. "'You were dismal at charms and defence, and this is supposed to be much harder!' "'What did you do differently?' Pansy asked. "'I mean, what were you thinking when you did it?' "'I was thinking I'd like something to poke Malfoy with,' Rigel said. Pansy looked as though she couldn't tell if Rigel was joking or not. "'I guess you just needed the right motivation, then.' Malfoy smirked. Rigel stifled a groan at the satisfaction in his smug face. "'So this means we can annoy you in every class. In fact, we're practically obligated to. Pansy and I are the key to your success.' After transfiguration, on the way to Herbology, Zabini approached them. Rigel didn't know much about the boy besides what people said about his mother, but he had a quiet presence when he spoke. I noticed your success in McGonagall's class. Looks like those two were exaggerating this morning. He nodded at her shadows. I think it was just a fluke, Rigel said. Perhaps that particular match had been a needle before. The dark boy raised an unconvinced eyebrow. In any case, Slytherin House seems to have gained an unexpected asset in you, Black. Likewise, I'm sure, Zabini. Rigel nodded politely as they reached the greenhouses, and Professor Sprout ushered them inside. Professor Sprout was a hands-on teacher. She set them to examining different soils and guessing what types of magical plants would grow best in each one. Rigel knew the properties of a lot of plants as they were used in potions, but she hadn't known growing conditions could have so much impact on potency. She was shocked to discover that, if grown in the wrong soil, Flitterbloom lost half of its nutritional value. That meant for a vitamin potion to be up to standard, it would require twice as much. She vowed to start asking where the ingredients she purchased were grown before using them in her potions. After Herbology, they were all slightly dirty, but they had flying that afternoon, so no one bothered cleaning up before lunch. Malfoy was practically vibrating in his seat. He was so excited, and he mentioned three separate times that he couldn't believe first years weren't allowed their own brooms. Rigel put a hand on his arm the fourth time his leg bumped into hers because he couldn't stop himself from bouncing it and he finally calmed enough to finish his lunch with some decorum. She shared an amused glance with Pansy, who seemed unimpressed by the idea of flying on a broom in general, much less in front of half the students in their year. They had flying with the Gryffindors, and the barrier between the houses was never more apparent to Rigel than the moment they reached the pitch. The Gryffindors lined up along one side, while the Slytherins took the other. She recognised Neville from the train and smiled slightly in his direction when he noticed her. Pansy eyed a girl called Lavender Brown mistrustfully, probably for her first name alone, and Malfoy stared down the gangly, red-headed Weasley as though he'd insulted Malfoy's family crest. The boy seemed just as unhappy to be looking at Malfoy, and Rigel wondered if they'd ever encountered one another in life or only in rumour. Madame Hooch blew her whistle to get their attention. Today we're going to cover the basics. I know many of you have brooms of your own at home and will likely think this review beneath you, but if you plan to play Quidditch for your house, you'll want to be sure you have the fundamentals down. Don't worry. She grinned like a shark. If you've been doing it wrong your whole life, I'll tell you. Completely unreassured, the class nevertheless followed her directions and a dozen students started screaming, Up! at their brooms. Malfoy rolled his eyes and snapped his fingers imperiously at the old comet beside him. Up! 
It flew into his hand as though it had simply been waiting for an opportunity to do so. Pansy got hers to roll over a few times before eventually losing patience. She picked it up off the ground with a scowl on her face. Rigel said, Up! in a tone that was apparently not convincing enough for her shooting star. Malfoy, who was on Rigel's right, looked over and said, "'It's the same thing as a Wingardium Leviosa, but the broom channels the magic instead of your wand. You have to mean it, Black.' "'Why can't I pick it up like Pansy did?' she asked, knowing full well what Malfoy was going to say. "'Because you'll never learn that way.' He shot Pansy a look around Rigel and said, "'Pansy doesn't want to learn, but you should take this seriously.' Why? she said again, deciding Malfoy was more interesting, exasperated. She wondered how long it would take for him to become completely fed up with her. I don't want to learn either, he frowned at her. You have to like Quidditch. If Pansy doesn't like it, you have to, so that I'm not the only one in our group. She raised her eyebrows at his reasoning. Since when were they a group? Malfoy's expression was determined enough to deter further argument. All right, she said. Up! The broom rose steadily to her waiting hand, and the wood seemed to thrum with anticipation beneath her fingers. She looked regretfully down at the old broom, knowing it would be ever so disappointed when she pretended to wobble in the air. If people knew she wasn't horrible on a broom, they might want her to try out for the house team in a few years. Quidditch would both detract from her potion studies and provide unnecessary opportunities for someone to discover her secret. Sirius might sneak onto the grounds to watch his son play, or someone on the team might walk in on her changing in the locker room, not to mention the extra attention. If she did somehow make the team, too much scrutiny was dangerous. She had too much to hide. "'Mount your brooms!' Madame Hooch called, demonstrating how they were to swing one leg over to the other side. Everyone got more or less situated, and she said, "'Now on the count of three, I want all of you to push lightly off the ground, "'hover for a moment, then come back down by leaning forward slightly. "'One!' "'But Neville was already airborne and rising steadily. "'Several students gasped, and the round-faced boy gripped the broom tightly, "'his face chalk-white with terror. "'Hooch pushed off the ground and flew toward him, "'stretching out a hand to try and pull him to safety. "'Where was her wand?' Before Hooch could reach him, Neville's grip failed. He plummeted straight down with a scream that wrenched at Rigel's gut, and all she could think in frozen dismay was if there was anything in her whole life she ever wanted to make levitate. It was Neville, right now. Fire, blazing hot, raced through her blood, and... He was slowing, stopping, hovering a few inches above the ground in a shivering daze, and Rigel realised she was holding her hand out toward him, as if in supplication. His milky, hazel eyes met hers, and the look of fearful gratitude in them made her hand tremble. The spell broke, and Neville landed with a relieved exhalation of breath on the soft grass. Hooch landed moments later and helped the boy to his feet. When it was clear that he was shaking too much to stand, she said, Poor boy, you've had quite a scare. Let's get you to the hospital wing for a calming draught. She swung him up into her arms, showing surprising strength for a person of her height, and called over her shoulder, "'Stay here and on the ground, or you'll be in detention until you graduate.' Rigel had tucked her hands into her pockets when Neville hit the ground, but it was too late to avoid attention. Most of the class was staring at her. She could see the Gryffindors wrestling between relief that their classmate hadn't been hurt and suspicion that a snake would help a lion for no reason. Her own housemates were just plain gaping at her, having been under the understandable impression that she couldn't even perform the levitation charm, much less on a heavy moving object and somehow without a wand. Rigel's reality had shifted in exactly the same way, and not wanting to examine that line of questioning further, turned pointedly to Pansy and said, Do you think Professor Sprout will care where we acquire the soil sample we're supposed to analyse for our homework? Pansy just blinked at her, for once at a complete loss, Rigel turned to Malfoy. I mean, she can't expect us to traipse through the Forbidden Forest, right? We could probably just ask the gamekeeper for a sample from his garden. Malfoy looked as though he was considering slapping her, so she narrowed her eyes and said, Stop looking at me like I'm hysterical. Just drop it. Drop, he swore softly. You are beyond words, and that is not a compliment. She shrugged and was about to change the subject again when she noticed the red-headed Gryffindor walking their way. With nervous foreboding in her stomach, she put on the friendliest expression she could muster while still sorting through the panic inside. 
Hey, he began hotly. Rigel interrupted. Hey, you know Neville, right? I, yeah, of course. The redhead frowned. He's in our dorm, but great. She smiled stiffly. Can you tell him I hope he's okay when you see him next? Well, sure, I guess. Confusion has taken the wind out of his hostility. Oh, how rude of me. Rigel extended her hand toward the Gryffindor's face. I'm Rigel Black. If you just tell him Rigel said hi, he'll know who you mean. Ron Weasley? He scrutinised her hand in a careful way that made Pansy stiffen. Rigel wondered if he could tell it was still tingling. It's fine, Pansy, Rigel said, pitching her voice to a soothing cadence. If my brothers were the Weasley twins, I'd be in the habit of looking for pranks everywhere, too. On my honour, it's just a hand, she promised. He had the decency to flush embarrassedly, but seized on the excuse as he shook her hand briefly. Can't be too careful with those two. I understand, Rigel assured him. The Gryffindor seemed to remember suddenly why he'd come over in the first place, and demanded, Why do you stop Neville from falling? More like how, Malfoy muttered. I didn't realise my intervening would offend anyone, she said, deciding to bluff and act as if she'd meant to do it. Better to show strength, not weakness. I'll be sure to leave it to you next time. That's not, I mean, Weasley pressed his lips together in open frustration. What's in it for you? "'It's always a tragedy when good blood goes to waste,' she said seriously. "'The Longbottom family is very ancient, "'and it would be a shame for their line to die out from such an avoidable accident.' "'She was actually rather proud of that response. "'She thought it sounded appropriately pure-blooded and mercenary "'considering the reputation of her house. "'Weasley looked as if all his worst fears had been realised, "'so she must have said something right.' He scoffed dismissively at her and began to stalk back to his side of the pitch. Perhaps it would have ended there if only Malfoy had kept his big mouth shut. He snorted loud enough for those around them to hear. Oh, yes, what a tragedy to lose someone with so much potential to grow into a muggle-loving blood traitor like his parents. Weasley immediately drew his wand and said a spell so fast that Rigel would later suspect he'd been waiting for an excuse. A jet of sickly yellow light shot toward Malfoy who looked gobsmacked at the idea of anyone actually attacking him for what he probably considered casual banter. Pansy let out an outraged noise, but it was Rigel who unthinkingly lunged sideways to move Malfoy out of the path of the jinx. Perhaps she was too used to playing protector to her cousin, who was often caught in the unexpected consequences of his own thoughtlessness. The hex struck her square in the shoulder and knocked her backwards into the grass. It didn't hurt, but it should have. Distantly, she heard Pansy protest and Malfoy shout while Weasley stuttered that it was supposed to have hit him. This didn't make Malfoy any happier, and as Rigel sat up slowly, rubbing at the dirt off her arm from where she'd hit the ground, she saw Weasley running back toward his housemates while Knott and Zabini prevented Malfoy from pursuing. What an odd turn of events. Her voice was bleary, or perhaps only in her head. I hope someone tells Malfoy he looks like an angry Neasel. Pansy bent down to offer Rigel a hand, saying, Draco, leave it. Rigel's fine. Rigel stared at the hand. How did Pansy get her fingernails to look like polished silver? Malfoy broke from the other boy's hold. He crouched down next to Pansy. You all right, Black? I'm all wrong. She smiled into his concerned face. Wrong hair, wrong place, and my eyes. These aren't my eyes. I've stolen yours, I'm afraid. What? He frowned at her. You're not making any sense. "'You can't make sense,' she said solemnly. "'You have to find it.' "'This statement struck her as exhausting, "'so she flopped back onto the ground and stared at the sky, "'wondering how long it would keep raining honey. "'They were going to be awfully sticky for dinner. "'What's wrong with him?' Malfoy demanded. "'Weasley, what the bloody hell did you do to him?' "'It was just a jelly-legs jinx!' Weasley yelled back. His face was a remarkable shade of red that made his hair blush with jealousy. It wasn't supposed to even knock him down. A jelly-legs jinx is orange-red in colour. Zabini peered down at Rigel with a pitying grimace. That one looked more like a jelly-brains jinx to me. Jelly-brains? Pansy lost her carefully cultivated calm, and Rigel discovered her blonde friend was actually a gust of icy wind in human form. You turned his brains to jelly? Pan, it's OK. "'Rigel said in her best calming tone. "'It came out a bit on the giggly side. "'The sky is going to rain honey all week, "'and if all of me turns to jelly, "'then everyone can have toast.' 
Malfoy growled at Weasley. You better get over here and fix him this instant, you incompetent prat, or my father is going to... What in Merlin's name is going on here? Madame Hooch was back, and she looked like a Valkyrie answering the call of a lightning storm. Mr. Black, are you all right? No, Pansy said, calm once more, though a bit breathless. No, he's not all right. He's got jam for brains. Ah! The flying instructor pulled Rigel up into a sitting position by her shoulders and stared intently into Rigel's face. Her eyes were like tennis balls, flitting back and forth, only Rigel couldn't tell who was winning the match. The jelly brains jinx, was it? Not to worry, Miss Parkinson, it'll wear off soon enough. Who is responsible for this? Weasley, Malfoy ground out. This is how the Gryffindors decided to repay Black for saving their useless housemate's life. I didn't do that, Rigel said earnestly. It was magic that did it. I was just pointing at him at the time. You shouldn't be so growly, she added with a regretful look. It makes your eyebrows twitch something terrible. Pansy choked on a laugh and tried to help Rigel stand. What a mess! Why would you take that jinx? Seriously, Black? Malfoy hadn't yet found his own amusement. Of the three of us, you're the only one who doesn't know the shield charm. What gives you the right to jump in front of an unknown spell? Rigel carefully disentangled herself from Pansy. I'd rather you didn't hug me, she said. I don't want your mother to get the wrong idea. Pansy chuckled wryly. Why would she get the wrong idea? Don't you like me like that? I'm crushed, really. I thought you might be, Rigel sighed. It's all Sirius's fault. He tarnished my reputation, so now I'm stuck being friends with a Malfoy. I'd resent that if you were in your right mind, Malfoy sniffed. Consider yourself blessed to even be worthy of my presence. Are you an angel, then, Malfoy? she asked. You don't look much like one, but I suppose that explains why Pansy hangs around with you. Madam Hooch blew her whistle to dismiss the class, and Pansy and Malfoy marched her as quickly as possible back to the castle. The jinx didn't wear off until they were almost back to the common room, and her first clue was the throbbing ache in her shoulder where the jinx had hit her. The headache came next. Rigel groaned, pulled away from their hold, and gripped her head fiercely. Rigel? Pansy asked cautiously. I know why it's called the Jelly Brains Jinx now, she moaned over the pounding of her skull. It's because your head feels as though it's been squished like a berry when it wears off. Ouch! The other two let out twin sighs of relief. Thank Merlin, Malfoy drawled. I don't think I could take another minute of the inanities that were dribbling out of your mouth. Honestly, Draco, Pansy said softly, trying not to cause Rigel any more pain. He took that curse for you. Nobody asked him to, Malfoy muttered. Wasn't trying to, Rigel shot back. Sometimes my muscles spasm without my control. She stopped at the inconspicuous stretch of wall. Ouroboros. They walked with her through the common room, and an unspoken agreement was made not to bring up the flying lesson Neville's near fall or Rigel's stint in La La Land for the rest of the day. They worked on their herbology assignment until dinner. Pansy and Draco finished theirs, but Rigel couldn't concentrate, and it wasn't only the lingering headache that rankled. She couldn't stop thinking about the burning rush that boiled through her veins when Neville's fall had been stopped. When she had stopped it. No, when something had stopped it. She wasn't convinced it had anything to do with her. And even if it did, it definitely wouldn't happen again. 